Uh, good morning, everyone, and a huge welcome to our first UDL conference. We are so thrilled this, this day has finally come. As with any event, it is months in planning and organising stages. Uh, it always seemed to be away in the future at the end of May, and then suddenly here we are, it is the end of May. It would have been so lovely to host this event on campus to give people a chance to meet and interact, especially over coffee and lunch, when all the best decisions and ideas are made. And how we miss having that cup of coffee and scone or sandwich actually handed to us. The things we took for granted pre-COVID, but we are getting there. And with the vaccination rollout going so well, we may even be able to fly to conferences again soon. As you have seen from our advertisements and promotion, this is the Connacht Ulster Alliance CUA conference. So delighted to welcome all our members and colleagues from LYIT and GMIT who have contributed to the oral and poster presentations today. Thank you to everyone who sent in poster abstracts and presentations. It was so fantastic to see such variety from across a number of higher ed, further ed and networks. The posters are going to be printed as A1 size and displayed across the campus for, for when staff and students return next semester. I want to encourage everyone today to please access the poster presentations brochure. The link to access will be available in the chat box and it is also on our UDL IT Sligo webpage. The link for this is also in the chat box. We've been so impressed with, with the diversity of posters. It was also brilliant that first year students who recently took part in group projects in the Faculty of Social Sciences under the guidance of their lecturer Cathy O'Kelly submitted their winning projects in poster format for inclusion. And is in fact the steps which we were progressing here at IT Sligo as part of this year's national funding um, SALTA fund where we wanted to conceptualise the student voice through UDL. So to focus more on the effectiveness of embedding UDL within curricula from the students' perspective. With that in mind, I want to thank the National Forum for their support of our UDL projects past and present through both SATL and seminar series funding. After our conference today, we'll be sending out an online feedback link if you would please complete. We'll also put that link in the chat box too for your convenience. This conference is very much a team effort. I cannot express my thanks enough for having such a motivated UDL working group who are always full of ideas, enthusiasm and willingness to try something new and even take risks. I think we all give each other courage and we know that most importantly, we have each other's back, so therefore great support. Each conference theme is chaired by one of our UDL working group members, so you will get to meet everyone who is taking part in the working group at some stage today. I also want to thank my right-hand woman, Patricia Henry, who is my self-support officer, and what a support. Patricia is one of the most hard-working people I've met, and I'm beyond lucky to have her working so closely with me. Despite going on maternity leave in two weeks' time, she has worked tirelessly on all aspects of this conference. So a big thank you, Patricia, and please do not go into labour today. Behind the scenes too is Ollie Melia, who has been fantastic in steering us in the right direction, especially with what platform to use, when to do things, how to promote the conference. His expertise and guidance has kept us all calm and reassured. So finally, just some housekeeping to remind everyone of, even though you're all probably really familiar with Zoom and online events by now. Just to point out that this event is taking place on Zoom webinar and therefore attendees don't have the option to actually speak, only listen. However, we do have two places where you can contribute. One is the chat box for any discussion and comments. For specific questions, can you please use the Q&A box as this is where the chair of each theme selects questions for the presenters. After the IT Sligo project presentation, each oral presenter has eight minutes for the presentation and depending on time, we will put one or two of your questions to each presenter. A reminder also that the conference is being recorded and will be available on our UDL webpage after the event. Many people signed up but cannot attend today or you might wish to dip in and out, therefore the recording will be helpful afterwards. I'm now going to call on IT Sligo President Dr Brendan McCormack to welcome you all to today's events. Brendan, over to you. Thank you very much, Neve. Students, colleagues, delegates, keynotes, and special guest lecturers, they give me great pleasure to welcome you to this conference on climbing the UDL ladder. I'd also like to welcome the chair of our governing body, Mr. Neil Donlan, who is attending here today, and also colleagues from the further education sector. It's great to see such a turnout from across the whole of education. I really like the imagery conveyed by the title of the conference. Our education system is built on the concept of the ladder of progression. 
progressing up the levels of learning. And calling a, that a UDL ladder is a strong statement that UDL is actually a core requirement to enable student success. UDL is in fact the sidebars of the ladder that hold the level rungs together. You'd know I was an engineer. Here in Ida Sligo, we have a strategic objective to foster inclusion and participation of all students, and specifically to embed UDL for learning across programmes with appropriate training and support. So a related objective is to support the continuous professional development of staff. Over the past three years, more than 150 staff have attended UDL workshops and seminars. 80 plus staff have attained a digital badge or have demonstrated evidence of UDL through curriculum changes. And 31 lecturers took part in a significant UDL project in 2020. And you'll hear more about this project shortly. To make this happen, we've established a UDL working group under the management of our Center for Education, Learning and Teaching to drive UDL progression across the Institute. And this is led by the indefatigable Neve Plunkett. This working group has developed a number of key guideline, guiding principles to embed UDL, creating a cross-campus approach to implementing a culture of inclusion and diversity. What that means is getting the message out to a wider audience of lecturers that diversity is here to stay and that we need to build inclusivity into how we educate. It's not for the few, it's for the many. Staff from all disciplines working together, that's another key element. So it's not a niche technique we're developing. And we're providing a framework to incorporate best inclusive practice by having a UDL work plan, applying measurable assessment tools so we know we're being effective in achieving inclusivity and creating inclusive curriculum design and effective instructional design techniques. As you may have heard, we made a fairly big announcement on Friday, an engagement announcement, if you like, between the three institutes of GMIT, LYIT, and IT Sligo, with the proposal of marriage sitting in the hands of the minister, Simon Harris. With his blessing, we hope to become a technological university in early January 2022. Today is the first conference since that announcement, and we are already building our collaboration with colleagues in both GMIT and LYIT to ensure an effective institute-wide approach to providing teaching, learning, and assessment through a UDL lens. The UDL group is providing a set of practical supports for all lecturers, a UDL inclusive audit toolkit, though the UCD toolkit and the CAST audit have been adopted to suit the needs of our staff and students. We're also redeveloping our syllabus management software to ensure UDL is embedded from the outset as modules and programs are developed or redesigned. And we are compiling a digital repository of all UDL resources accessible to staff. We also believe that's important to capture the student voice in this work. And we're very grateful to the National Forum for funding our project, conceptualizing UDL with a student voice. At the end of the day, we are professional educators, and it's important that we share what we have learned. And we want to spread the word through this inaugural UDL conference today, sharing best practice from across the country, and making available all of a UDL best practice toolkit for implementing UDL in higher education and further education, and facilitating national workshops on, for example, inclusive audits, digital inclusion, inclusive curricula, and continuing with the national rollout of the digital badge, both here in Sligo and across the CUA. And I should say, you can see where this is heading towards the creation of a national higher education centre for excellence in inclusive practice. And that's where collectively we can help and support each other. Like everybody here, we're contributing to the review of the national access plan. And there's a strong recommendation coming through from most HEIs that UDL as a teaching and learning framework should be a central pillar in the next iteration of the plan. IT Sligo shares that vision, and that's why it's an objective within our strategic plan. Can I take the liberty of thanking, on all your behalf, the conference organizers, Neil Plunkett, Maureen Harn, Patricia Henry, and ably backed up and supported and guided by Ollie Media, and their committee for all the hard labor in organizing this event with over 500 delegates. Quite an enormous effort went into planning and delivering this amazing event this year. 
And the care package was a wonderful touch and very welcome. Thank you uh, for that nice uh, touch. Thank you all again for attending the 2021 UDL conference. And I look forward to welcoming you all in person on our campus when it's safe to return. Finally, it is my privilege to introduce a special video message from the Minister for Further Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science, Simon Harris. Thank you very much. Back to you, Neil. Hi there, thanks so much for inviting me to be with you today, at least virtually, at the Universal Design for Learning inaugural conference at IT Sligo. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hope this conference is a really great success. I principally want to be with you today to commend you, to commend all of you in your journey in embedding UDL as a framework for teaching at IT Sligo over the past two to three years. And I also want to thank you for showcasing at this conference some of the excellent work completed by lecturers right across our higher education institutions as part of the national rollout digital badge in UDL that was developed by both UCD and AHEAD. The theme of the conference today is so important. It's around the issue of student engagement, improving student experience through digital enhancement, learning through COVID-19 and adopting alternative pathways to success which can remove potential barriers and making learning goals attainable for all. As you all know, Universal Design for Learning is a framework based on, on three principles uh, for curriculum development that crucially gives all individuals an equal opportunity to learn, including students with disabilities. UDL is based on the idea that there's no such thing as a typical student or an average student, that we all learn differently, that every student is different, and that to successfully teach all our students, we have to introduce greater flexibility in teaching and in learning practice. UDL aims to improve the education experience of all our students by introducing more flexible methods of teaching, assessment, and service provision to cater for the great diversity of learners in our lectures, in our classrooms, and in online learning environments as well. In many ways, universal design for learning is in, a, in, is in and of effect the embodiment of human rights in action. This is a model that was devolved with responsibility for inclusion, not just the remit of the disability office, Inclusion has to be the responsibility of everybody right throughout the organisation. Inclusion is everyone's business. And that means a commitment to both the provision of high quality individual supports, high quality group supports, and a state and institutional commitment to reducing barriers in the learning environment and the curriculum as well. And in doing so, we aim to reduce the need for individual reasonable accommodations as we provide more support and remove barriers for all students directly in the mainstream. We're developing our new national access plan uh, this year. I'm really excited about this. We've made a lot of progress when it comes to access over the last number of years in our country, but we have much more to do. And I have absolutely no doubt that the work you are doing in IT Sligo and the work so many of you are doing in higher education institutions right across the country in embedding UDL in all you do will make a real and meaningful difference as we try to improve access and open up access to everybody to further and higher education in the coming months and years. I wish you all the very best with your conference. I think listening to students and engaging with students, hearing their voices and hearing how we can do even better is so crucial. I hope you have a great conference and I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Good morning. Uh, again, I just want to thank uh, Minister Simon Harris for taking the time to record such a lovely personal um, and encouraging message. I think it's obvious he knows and realises the importance of UDL and in driving it forward as an integral part of the National Access Plan. Uh, Patricia, can I now ask you to play the short video from the National Forum? Um, and then I'm going to invite Ellen McCabe, a member of our UDL working group, to do a quick Mentimeter poll with all the attendees. So if you want to have your mobile phone handy. Thank you.
everyone. So as Neve was clearly mentioning, um, we have attendees joining us from all over Ireland today and beyond, I think, as well. Um, so we're going to do like a little activity to just kind of get a sense of that since we can't all kind of really chat. So if everyone could go to menti.com, I was going to put the information into the chat now and just enter the following code, um, 818-32430. So it's uh, just in the chat there. And I'll share my screen. And just tell us where you're joining us from today. Great, so we've got loads, loads of our colleagues in anyway from Sligo and Roscommon. Okay, so we've got some people from the UK in today as well. And you can see there's a good good spread all over Ireland. And uh, yeah, so it's just great to get a sense of where everyone is and see where everyone's joining us from today. That's fabulous, isn't it, Ellen? Yeah. I'm Cape Town, South Africa. I have no idea what time it is there. Yeah. <laughs> and Canada. There's someone in from Canada today as well. Wow. Uh, they're up early. Yeah. Because <laughs> our, our keynote speaker, Frederick, is from Canada. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, oh, Carney. <laughs> All over Sligo. Lovely Leitrim. Yeah. Tubber Curry, you're my friend. Loads of. <laughs> United Arab Emirates. That has to be Colin. <laughs> oh, okay. It's lovely. That's, been, that's fantastic. Again. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just great to get to kind of yes. get an idea. So it's unfortunate we can all kind of have a good chat and. Um, from where we're all coming from today, but um, at least we get a little bit of a sense of it from uh, this little graphic. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'll hand back over to you now, Niamh. That's been fantastic, and thank you very, very much. And again, people okay. literally from the length and breadth of Ireland. Um, so we're now going to kickstart um, our conference uh, by showcasing IT Sligo's national funded um, Sattle project entitled an, an, an Effective Institutional Approach to Teaching, Learning and Assessment Through a Universal Design for Learning Lens. So I just ask Patricia if you wouldn't mind sharing that video, please. Hello everyone. In 2019, we received non-competitive funding from the National Forum for Enhancement of Teaching and Learning and immediately we wanted to prioritise our ongoing efforts with the development of staff understanding and knowledge alongside the implementation of universal design for learning into curricula across the Institute. Our project lead for this exciting and still ongoing initiative is Maureen Harn, lecturer in social sciences and UDL lead within the Institute. Working with Maureen on the project are Dr. Shelley Brady, our Disability Officer, and Dr. Ella McCabe, one of our instructional designers. They will now provide an in-depth account of their roles and function within, with the IT Sligo UDL project, its implementation and impact. I would also like to acknowledge the commitment and work of our UDL working group, whose membership comprises of the project group, including myself, Maureen, Shelley and Helen, and in addition, Cathy O'Kelly and Mairead McCann, both lecturers in the Faculty of Business and Social Sciences, Dr Geraldine Dowling, lecturer in the Faculty of Science, and Patricia Henry, CELT Support Officer. Together we are driving the implementation of UDL forward across our institute and with our partners in the CUA. 
This is only the start of our journey. We have made great strides in only a short few years, but having the commitment from senior management and UDL actioned in our strategic plan, we have also been able to approach UDL from an operational perspective with buy-in from staff, which has been instrumental in our success to date. I hope you enjoyed the project presentation and I will now pass you over to Maureen and colleagues. Hello and welcome to the Institute of Technology Sligo. You see before you an image of a fish and I have used this analogy before, but it is always fitting. The fish in this image is what is known as the salmon of knowledge. In Irish folklore, the salmon of knowledge is a symbol of eternal knowledge. As you can see from this slide, the salmon of knowledge is situated at the entrance to IT Sligo, which symbolizes our commitment to fostering learning. Each year on International Day for People with Disabilities, this fixture is illuminated purple to represent what IT Sligo holds dear in its teaching and learning and that is fostering a culture of inclusion. Today, Dr. Shelley Brady, Disability Officer, Dr. Ellen McCabe, Instructional Designer, and myself, Maureen Haran, Lecturer, all from IT Sligo, will present on an effective institutional approach to teaching and learning and assessment through a universal design for learning lens. Our talk will highlight our collective efforts, which have contributed to a wider initiative that seeks to implement and embed UDL into our teaching and learning across the campus at IT Sligo. What will you as a participant learn from our presentation? There are four learning outcomes associated with our talk today. And these are identify components in a strategic UDL work plan that integrates various levels of collaboration through an interdisciplinary project. Analyze effective measurable tools that explore assessment of UDL inclusive practices within an institute. Learn to attribute developments in inclusive curriculum design through bespoke UDL curriculum planning, where the goals of inclusive practice can be realized. And finally, to ascertain pathways to create instructionally designed interactive roadmaps for UDL initiative stages and, and promotion. Last academic year, the UDL Working Group within IT Sligo submitted an application to the NFETL Satchel, which is the National Forum for Enhancement in Teaching and Learning, Strategic Alignment of Teaching and Learning, Enhancement Funding in Higher Education. The Institute have been working on several UDL initiatives for the last three and a half years. This saw the establishment of a UDL working group that consider themselves the converted. After participating in some of these initiatives, they can attest to the benefits of this framework. The initiatives started initially with laying the groundwork in getting staff to gain an understanding of what is UDL and what are the benefits to both staff and students. This was carried out through a series of workshops with experts in the area. A UDL working group was established in 2019 and includes the Head of Teaching and Learning, graduates of the National Forum Digital Badge, Instructional Designer and Disability Officer. This group planned a UDL rollout and institute-wide implementation, which is the basis of this presentation. Our presentation is divided between the areas of the UDL and FETL funded initiative that we each have worked on exclusively, and I will address IT Sligo's UDL Digital Badge facilitation, the Inclusive Practice Module Audit Initiative, and the National Collaboration Peer Facilitation, known as the National UDL 2020 UDL Digital Program. IT Sligo's UDL Badge facilitation had been actioned in the College's Strategic Plan 2017 to 2022, which sets out a series of strategic objectives, one notable one being foster inclusion and participation of all students, embed universal design for learning across programs with appropriate training and support. Despite UDL actioned in the Institute's Strategic Plan, little had been done in advancing and um, achieving staff understanding of UDL nor implementation in modules and programs. It was apparent from the strategic plan actions that management and leadership understood the importance of embedding UDL across programs. However, there was little involvement with staff from an operational perspective. Rather than mandating the inclusion of UDL across modules and programs, the approach taken differs from that to other HEIs, insofar as UDL is considered from a bottom-up as well as a top-down perspective. While UDL was deemed important by senior management, getting staff involved at operational level through establishment of a UDL working group increased collaboration, increased motivation, and hence faster innovation. This has proven to be a more holistic and systems approach 
that has resonance with staff and a relevance to improving a learning environment for our students. Driven from, as I mentioned, the top-down and bottom-up approach, we provided initial workshops to interested staff. Given that my background in both teaching and disability awareness, I became the Institute UDL facilitator and lead. I facilitated the delivery of the National Forum Digital Badge once per semester to interested staff. The badge comprises 25 hours of learner effort and a reflective exercise. The UDL participants sought to make one change to their module, implement that change, survey their students for feedback, and produce a case study on this development. This was facilitated through Moodle, which is an open source learning platform, which was easily accessible to staff and served as the online classroom. From 2018 to 2020, 143 staff have attended workshops, seminars related to understanding UDL, and 79 staff had attained a National Form Digital Badge in UDL or demonstrated significant change in their module to align with UDL principles. These people have become our UDL champions. In 2019, a staff member was one of those educators nationally shortlisted for the annual John Kelly Award in, uh, for UDL within Ireland. Four additional staff went on to take up the facilitator's digital badge in UDL, and the Institute now has five facilitators of the badge. As part of a wider plan to actively promote UDL across the Institute through a variety of communication tools, workshops, UDL digital badge attainment and active engagement with UDL related projects and research, the inclusive practice module audit emerged. What was evident from the outset was that no matter the number of workshops, guest speakers, and even digital badge attainment, this alone does not ensure UDL development or implementation in curricula. Staff may have an understanding, however, it was quickly acknowledged through discussions that they need continued support and one-to-one -one facilitation to underpin their module or program with UDL principles. With limited resources and no staffing, the Center for Enhancement of Teaching and Learning needed to maximize on the goodwill of those who had an interest in implementing UDL to support all students. Through the HGA Satchel Funding 2019, this provided an opportunity to enact what staff had requested, one-to-one -one support and training to enable them to embed principles of UDL within their module. A pilot study that was carried out in summer of 2019 informed this project. This was carried out with one staff member from the Faculty of Business who agreed to have all of her content from one module reviewed against an inclusive assessment tool. Using Dr. Lisa Padden and Dr. Anna Kelly from Access and Lifelong Learning in, in University College Dublin, who have done phenomenal work in their publication, University for All, and the Inclusive Toolkit, which has been widely shared, and the CAST organization, who have also shared the guidelines within the three principles of EDL, which is completely accessible online, I combined these shared resources to create a toolkit unique to the needs of IT Sligo, which has aided me in carrying out inclusive UDL audits with my colleagues. These are the shared resources and a snapshot of the unique toolkit created by IT Sligo as a result. This toolkit has enabled us to narrow our focus and zero in on how compliant our modules are or, or are not. 31 staff volunteered to take part. Without questioning, they handed over their module to be audited against UDL compliance. This is significant insofar as it demonstrates the trust that staff have in the UDL facilitators as they were willing to hand over their content and resources and possibly be judged. While it was important for lecturers to understand the changes, it was vital that their heads of department and heads of faculty were also knowledgeable. Lecturers needed the support of their line manager, so I provided one-to-one -one training to all heads of departments and heads of faculty, which not only provided that opportunity to learn, but it demonstrated to staff that these principles were viewed as being important by management. In autumn of 2020, AHEAD and UCD Access and Lifelong Learning teamed up to jointly deliver the digital badge for UDL in a fully online format. This digital badge course hosted by the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning provided participants with a strong introduction to the Universal Design for Learning framework and gave them the opportunity to implement UDL approaches within teaching activities they are currently undertaking. Typically, the course runs for about 35 people. However, on this occasion, it was successfully completed by 536 participants simultaneously in further ed and higher ed. 
the largest nas national rollout of UDL continuous professional de development ever undertaken in Ireland. IT Sligo's five UDL badge facilitators were involved in this program, and collectively they facilitated 147 participants within IT Sligo, Letterkenny Institute of Technology, and other institutes around the country. IT Sligo were responsible for 22% of the national rollout. I now hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Shelley Brady, who will discuss the parts of the project that she has done exclusively. My name is Shelley Brady, and I am the Disability Support Officer in IT Sligo. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about inclusive curriculum design. So the UDL Working Group at IT Sligo have been considering how to embed UDL at programme and module level across the Institute. In order to ensure UDL is embedded, it stands to reason that staff need support in order to achieve this. So you've heard all about the wonderful staff support and training from Maureen, but another part of this puzzle was how are we going to support all staff at the module and programme build stage. In IT Sligo, we use a module programme management and build platform called Module Manager. It's a systematic tool and it brings you through each element of the module and program design. This is where we knew that we needed to support staff at this stage of the program and module build, and it was really important to ensure that the UDL principles were embedded within this platform as a result. We decided, decided to hold a focus group as it was imperative to learn from the experienced academic staff who are currently utilising Module Manager and learn how they were finding it, what difficulties were they experiencing and any feedback they could give us that would be useful. It was an ideal opportunity to hear how Module Manager was functioning for staff and it allowed us to listen to them talking through their thoughts and concerns and we could take them into consideration because ultimately they would be the end users of this product. It was important that their issues were addressed if it was to serve them as well as us producing some modifications to the product to support them in designing UDL compliant modules. So the focus group was really worthwhile. It was a really animated experience and there was a lot of discussion at it. Participants were introduced to UDL and what it was and what we were hoping to try to achieve in this project. They were then provided with a module and asked to design it step by step in smaller groups. There were so many useful and practical points made during this process. It really enabled us to do what we were setting out to do, which was to find the gaps and where they were at module and programme build levels. And the fact that we had these experienced staff members with experience of using Module Manager, writing modules and developing programmes meant that they were able to tell us exactly what they needed to be supported. So I'd like to take you through some of the recent changes and modifications that were made to Module Manager. As I mentioned, these were developed to support staff when they were developing and writing learning outcomes, teaching and learning strategies, as well as assessment strategies. The first change pertains to writing learning outcomes and provided a drop-down menu of NFQ levels between levels 6 and 10. The rationale for this was that the range of choice of verbs that we use when we're writing learning outcomes is influenced by the academic level of the module as well as the placement of the module within the academic program of study. So whether it's in first year as opposed to fourth year, or whether it's a level six or a level nine course of study, once the lecturers had chosen the learning outcomes level, they were writing the learning outcomes for, they were brought to the module learning outcomes page. We made taxonomy guides available to lecturers looking at knowledge, comprehension, application through to analysis, synthesis and evaluation. Not only this, but we also hyperlinked resources available through our CELT Moodle page, which included a checklist for writing learning outcomes, rules of thumb for writing learning outcomes, and guidance on writing learning outcomes specifically at level nine. 
So for whatever level selected by the lecturer in terms of NFQ specific guidelines, they were made available on this landing page across all levels. This is really useful for supporting staff in writing learning outcomes according to standardised guidelines. Supporting resources are also made available in the areas of teaching, learning and teaching strategies. At this stage of the module or programme build, the author would be considering each learning outcome and how it could be achieved through their teaching. So what we've done is we've provided a readily available list of strategies to support students' learning. There are over 20 strategies listed and any item that has resources available on the CELT Moodle page is hyperlinked here for immediate access and guidance. So for example, if the lecturer was to click on inquiry-based learning, they would be brought straight to the CELT Moodle page and resources available on inquiry-based learning would be made available to them. This is great support for staff and particularly for anyone who may be considering using certain teaching strategies but would like more support and guidance in it before including them in their module builds. Similarly in assessment strategies, different types of assessment have been listed for lecturers when they are considering what assessment strategies they may use. Guidance for assessment strategies listed are provided in hyperlinks back to the Moodle page, which holds useful articles, videos and resources, along with guidance on how to incorporate flexibility into assignments. We've also launched a series of workshops with experts of specific learning difficulties last month. These workshops give staff information on the impacts for students who identify as having any specific disability or learning difficulty by way of information and at time simulations. They've been designed to incorporate the principles of UDL by each speaker. So again, emphasising that this framework is beneficial for all, not just those registered with the disability or learning support services. The plan going forward is to continue to collaborate with these and other organisations, supporting educators to design and deliver curriculum for our wonderfully diverse student population. I would also just like to quickly thank Porog Ryan, who is the module manager developer, who worked with us on this project, and it most definitely would not have come to fruition if it were not for his IT skills and problem solving skills. My name is Elle McCabe and I'm an instructional designer with the Centre for Online Learning at IT Sligo. I'm going to be talking to you about the role of UDL in two major HEA funded projects, iNote and Higher Education for All. I'm also going to take you through some of the resources that we've created for staff. IT Sligo has a large online cohort and more than half of our approximately 8,000 students are online. While Higher Education for All and iNote are two very distinct projects, they both relate to online learning and they share common themes related to access, equity, student support and success. So UDL is a foundational principle for both of them. I'm firstly going to speak a bit about iNote. So iNote is a joint project with our Connacht Ulster Alliance partners, GMIT and Letterkenny IT. And it seeks to provide opportunities to transform the higher education experience in these CUA institutes. The specific role of IT Sligo in the process is the development of an online learning student support services model. One of the main challenges we faced was making supports as visible and legible as possible to students. We have a range of services available to students, but conveying the right information at the right time can be really challenging. And as often happens in organisations, sometimes supports can be quite siloed, and it might not be clear what supports can be used together or might be used at a similar stage or how they relate to one another. So students need to be quite motivated to seek out services that are relevant to them. Together with this, if they've been out of education for a long period of time, they might not have an awareness of what is available to them or what they might expect, or they could have a learning issue that hasn't been assessed. So we need to create our message in relation to student supports and position them in the context of the student learning journey, taking into consideration the different stages of the student experience. 
To achieve this, we looked at a kind of creating a guide that would take a broad bird's eye view of student supports throughout their time at IT Sligo and organise them so that the student can see at a glance the different types of supports that are available to accommodate their specific requirements, how they might relate to one another and when they could be most beneficial to them. While guides like these should enhance the visibility and clarity around supports to a large extent, you're still sort of depending on the student to seek them out as a kind of additional accommodation to their studies. And that in itself is a barrier. So as far as possible, you're trying to remove that necessity by embedding supports as an inherent part of the student's educational and social journey. One simple way of achieving that is by locating access to supports directly on course pages. And this way, put them in the context of the course so supports can be read visually as an integral part of the course that relates to other aspects like assessment and learning outcomes, and they can be framed in that way. To some extent, this can kind of mitigate the perception of supports as external or unrelated to their studies. Taking that a step further would be examining ways of embedding supports directly in the curriculum. And to achieve that, we've looked at the option of digital badges. Many of you might be familiar with digital badges. They're essentially an online representation of a skill or achievement you've earned. So we're designing flexible badges that lecturers can select elements of and include in their courses. In this way, they can embed core learning skills in their curriculum. On the top here, you can see some of the badges that we've created. We're also collaborating with Careers Office and creating a similar flexible badge related to employability as well as the library for one on critical analysis. So by embedding supports in this way, we locate them in the context of the curriculum and make them more meaningful to students and avoid that need for them to seek out services. Another important aspect we've been looking at is the accessibility of learning content itself. And one way we've been looking to address this is through the introduction of Blackboard Ally. Ally is a content accessibility service that integrates with the learning management system, so our one being Moodle. So within any institution, there's vast amounts of content being created all the time and circulated, so it can be really difficult to get a sense of where issues are arising. Improving accessibility obviously leads to quality and usability that benefits all students and is crucial in terms of UDL. Ally can help address this in three principal ways. So firstly, it automatically generates alternative formats for course content within Moodle. And this gives students the choice of accessible alternatives such as semantic HTML, audio, EPUB, electronic braille and tag PDF. It also checks and scores course content that is uploaded, providing feedback and guidance on how to fix identified accessibility issues to the lecturer. Together with this, it can analyze course content into an institution-wide report. And this gives us an insight into how the Institute is performing and where problems are and how things are evolving. Moving on to higher education for all, this project seeks to develop full-time online courses for individuals who, for whatever reason, can't make regular trips to campus. Through Higher Ed for All, we are actively working with advocate groups including Family Carers Ireland and Disability Federation Ireland, as well as ETBs, to create supportive pathways for marginalised learners. The project provides dedicated supports for lecturers to assist them in adopting highly flexible approaches to their teaching and allowing students to fit their study around any other responsibilities they may have, as well as their individual learning styles. Lecturers receive one-to-one -one training sessions, equipment, software, and other resources to help them achieve this. We also engage regularly with students to get a sense of how they're progressing, what they need, and to get feedback on how we can improve, as well as to facilitate social interaction. We currently have two programmes running, Writing and Literature and Health and Information Science. Next, I'm gonna talk about the resources we have in place. So we felt it was very important that initiatives like these, as well as the ones Shelley and Maureen were speaking about, are made visible and legible to staff in terms of how they are progressing the ethos of UDL throughout IT Sligo and are having a very real and tangible impact. 
And one simple way of achieving that is through a kind of a roadmap infographic. And this just very simply shows our progress towards UDL compliance and communicates at a glance what has been achieved and what is to come. It's also interactive so students and staff can kind of dig down um, into different aspects to find out more and how to get involved. And this roadmap is currently being updated to include many more recent developments. Elaborating on this is our UDL Moodle page, which showcases in much greater depth what is happening in relation to UDL in different areas of the Institute. The principles of UDL, how these can work in practice and are working through case studies, as well as a range of resources and supports for staff. To conclude, it is important to mention that early adoption of UDL at IT Sligo has been managed by a top-down, bottom-up leadership approach. Strong buy-in was achieved through seminars, workshops, the UDL digital badge attainment and active engagement with UDL-related products and research, demonstrating the benefits of UDL for all learners, rather than focusing solely on disability. Some key learnings from this funded project include ensuring that the technique is explicit, demonstrating the positive impact for students resulted in rapid adoption by staff and curriculum modifications for both new programs underpinned with UDL and existing programs through programmatic review. A top-down, bottom-up approach is most effective in applying UDL principles in curricula. Staff development should be flexible and inclusive in applying the contextual needs and drivers for UDL. Use case studies to evidence support success through the UDL principles. Research allows the development of new models of collaborative provision, enhanced engagement between academics, students, and professional educators. And that point, I mean that in tandem with this initiative, research is being undertaken to further explore all of this work. Other key learnings include audits of changes made to modules highlights the benefits of fostering inclusive teaching and learning, Accessible platforms improve the design experience, which consequently improves the student's experience. The aspects of digital inclusion allow students to access materials and content in multiple platforms and informs lecturers on content accessibility. It is important to capture the student voice, and this is the subject of future work underway this coming academic year. And one final thought is that designing systems for ease of use and understanding for staff is paramount to early adoption. This concludes our presentation. Thank you all very much for your time today. If you would like to connect with the UDL Working Group within IT Sligo, you can email us at udlworkinggroup at itsligo.ie. That's lovely. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed um, finding out about what we've been up to in IT Sligo over the past couple of years and how that project has kind of culminated um, um, in embedding UDL within our curriculum. Um, and as uh, Shelley discussed there as well, we felt it was really important to not just have staff to have an understanding of UDL um, and the principles, but also that it's embedded from the outset of, of developing our modules. Um, can I just ask as well, people are putting questions into the chat box. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just use the Q&A box as well for, for questions. We have some coming in there. Um, I might ask Maureen, Ellen um, and Shelley if you put on your cameras. I just have a couple of questions that I, I'll run by. Um, let me just see the first one here. Um, this is from David. The UDL Inclusive Audits Toolkit mentioned was used as a guided assessment tool in assisting lecturers. Is it possible for this to be a self-assessment and used as a digital support? I suppose, Maureen, would you be able to have a look at that? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Neve. Um, yeah, so the inclusive module audit um, can be accessed, uh, accessed through our, our uh, CELT Moodle page. Um, this is where an academic, academic can use the inclusive uh, UDL module audit um, for self-assessment and both a module, and then we've also created one for a program as well. Um, I have had a lot of interest on this after the head conference where um, we spoke on this uh, briefly there as well. Um, and there's been other HTIs around, around the country who've gotten in touch to say, you know, is, is this a shareable resource? And, you know, we are very happy and excited to share uh, best UDL practice. Um, the next UDL initiative phase that Neve mentioned earlier um, will be on capturing the student voice. And as part of this project, I will be working with our CUA partners too to share and provide training on these unique resources as well. That's fantastic. Actually, Maureen, uh, Brendan has also mentioned there as well, um, it's an excellent idea on mapping student support 
uh, it's such an important requirement for students to understand the range of supports uh, available. Um, and Brendan has actually just asked, do you believe that applying UDL principles is complementary to a move towards personalised learning or are there different approaches? Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting question. So personalised learning, um, you're looking more at like kind of indiv individual education plans, whereas universal design for learning really looks at the diversity in front of you. So it looks at the whole picture, the whole um, student diversity that's in front of you and how are you going to address every single learner that's, that's you know, there before you in the room. Um, whereas the um, uh, personalised learning is, is, is more of a different approach. Now, it does touch on that area because if you're catering to everybody's diversity and everybody's learning styles, um, you're certainly, um, you know, addressing all of this as, as you go along, which is in the design. Um, the uh, design and everything that Shelley mentioned um, is really, really important that when you're at the design stage that you're also keeping that in, in mind as well the personalized learning and looking to see at all, all the diversity in the room so you're kind of trying to touch um, several different uh, ranges all in, the, all in the one. Absolutely and actually uh, Jura's question kind of leads nicely onto that as well um, Ellen you might be um, able to answer this one as I note is a CUA project how did you approach developing student supports across the CUA? Yeah, well, I suppose at the beginning of the project, we identified like project partners in each of the institutes. Um, so they were they kind of formed the steering group for our iNote package. And um, we engaged with them on regular meetings and because we uh, about once a month. And in that way, we kind of had them involved from inception of a um, support um, develop, design right through to the evaluation. And they were then able to kind of point us in the direction of um, subject experts in their own institution who we could kind of work with then to roll it out in GMIT or LYIT and with any kind of um, contract that we um, procured or um, anything that we were designing we always made sure to have the three institutes um, included and um, so in that way we were kind of able to ensure that um, that there was involvement from all of the institutes and at the, at the outset as well um, the focus group uh, partners were all involved in uh, or the, the steering group partners are all, all involved in focus group research and I think that kind of established um, the uh, shared understanding of the trajectory for the project and a kind of a structure for it and um, so in that way it was very much kind of um, a CUA project that it, all of the partners were involved in. Yeah, and I think it's it's um, it's funny because uh, you know all of the ITs at the moment are moving towards a technological university status. Um, and congratulations, actually, to AIT and LIT who have been the most recent. But we're all having to kind of work together more. Um, and certainly, I think from our perspective, from IT Sligo, GMIT, LYIT, like we've been working really closely together for years. So it, it's become quite um, easy and streamlined for us because we know our partners um, so well. Um, and as you say, um, and we've kind of started to embed those sharing of student supports across the three campuses at the moment, which, which is fantastic. Um, there's a question here about module manager. Um, is, module, is the module manager format flexible? Uh, is it easy to change and update? Uh, Shelley, how did you find that when we were looking at um, module manager and amending it? Yeah, well, I think the only time I, I smiled during that presentation was when I mentioned poor Ryan's name. Um, and he, that was the brilliant thing about working so closely with Porg. He was the developer of Module Manager. So we had certain requests that we had that couldn't be supported by the platform, but Porg was always able to provide a workaround. So we now have that this great template, which we can add to and take away from as best practice changes. So yes, I suppose in answer to the question, it's a very fluid model now and it's a system which can be modified as needed. And I should also mention that we did work with our, our partners and I suppose request almost permission from the other partner that uses module manager. Um, so we had meetings with them with Cora Grind as well, just to make sure that they had access to this template as well uh, when using module manager. So it's great. Absolutely. Um, and as a matter of interest um, for the whole group, what, what did you find was the most challenging um, part of, of the project? Um, 
because the project comes to an end and you can see kind of the fantastic findings and how well it went, but was there any particular part that you felt was quite challenging? And I'm kind of thinking of from the perspective of um, other institutes who are who want to move from kind of understanding universal design for learning principles to actually embedding it and actually getting it into, you know, their teaching and learning framework. So I suppose I'm looking for like what, what would be the main challenge that you can kind of guide other people on um, and maybe give them some support. I'm happy to, to start. Um, so I, I, I'd say the very beginning was, was the, um, the toughest part of the entire project because um, we had to explain to people what it was that we're, we're setting up to do in the first place and um, you know, what was expected. And um, we then had to rely on the goodwill of people, our, our own colleagues, to trust us to, to work with them in, in a way. And, and I'm speaking about the inclusive uh, module audit um, in, in particular. Um, so you, you had to really be very clear on, on what it was that we were trying to do, that it was, it was a supportive tool and it was we're here to try to support you and to try to give you an understanding of, of what UDL is and how it can be so beneficial to your students. And you know, by engaging your students and, and, and thinking of them and reflecting first on how you've been practicing up to date and then taking in the principles and seeing where it all fits with what you're doing and how it aligns well, and then where you want to take it. So um, that was for me the the most difficult part was um, saying to everyone, okay, this is this is really really helpful, and this is what I want to do, and I want to work with you, and I want to support you and help you. Um, but from once people realized um, that you know um, we're here to su to support them, and that was asked kind of early on, um, you know going back and leave, as you know, several months ago before the, um, the project even started, um, there was kind of a lot of academics coming up saying, well, how do I do this? It's great to tell me, you know, you've told me about the principles, but how can I embed this? How can I implement this into my programs? So um, uh, from once we said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to work with you. We're going to look at your content and we're going to come away with loads of recommendations that you can take on board and, and seek to make a change. We didn't ask them to change loads just to, and, and only to reflect on it, to see what they were going to do going forward. Um, but yeah, it was definitely the, the initial stages of um, just getting people to, to trust us, um, which they did. I think that kind of goes back as well, Maureen, doesn't it? Um, what I love about our project is um, as we've mentioned a few times, we kind of looked at it from a top-down, bottom-up approach. So it, it's it's brilliant. It's action in our strategic plan, um, which means we have we have buy-in from leadership. They can see the value in it. Uh, but for us as well, it is more about getting that kind of operational perspective to get people on the ground. So in other words, lecturers who are in front of students and working with students to get their, as you say, more to get their buy-in um, and to get them to trust us as well that, you know, we, we want to support and we want this to be a really good teaching and learning framework for students. Um, just another question has come in. I'm, I'm not sure who it's from. It's anonymous. Is it possible to work with awarding bodies to have these changes implemented from NFQ level five? Um, if, if that's referring to the, the module manager changes, currently at IT Sligo, we deliver uh, levels six to 10. But yes, there's absolutely no reason because it is such a, a flexible model why those changes can't be applicable to an NFQ level five. So if, whoever that is, if they need any help or advice on something that they're working on, that's absolutely no problem. They can link in with us and I'd be happy to provide them with any help or advice I can. And the group would too, I know. Brilliant stuff, Shelley. Um, I'm just going to have another quick look at the, at the chat box here as well, or the questions and answers. Um, do you support students to develop their own learning toolkits? Since learning styles have been debunked as they're not useful concepts, UDL seems like it would be a good way to develop the diverse learning skills they will need. Sorry, I'm just trying. Am I muted or can you hear me? No, oh, I can hear you there. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting uh, question and an in interesting take, and that's something really to consider with the student voice now going forward. Um, so with the next um, uh, funding that's been ring-fenced by the National uh, uh, Forum, we're looking at the student voice. We're going to be um, working with the students, um, running focus groups to see, you know, students that have been a part of um, many of the badge redesigns through the Universal Design um, for Learning Digital Badge. 
we're going to be working with those specific cohort of students to see, well, how beneficial, you know, are these changes and um, kind of come from that angle. But that's something really to consider with the student voice project uh, with the funding going forward, because, um, you know, I think if we're going to try to include the students in their learning and get them to self-regulate their learning, uh, which is our ultimate UDL goal, um, if you've if you if you read the principles and, and, and you get to that end phase, you know that that's what we try to scaffold our students to do. So um, that's really something interesting to take on board for sure. Absolutely, and it's something that we're, we're all actually really excited about as a, as a UDL um, working group and project group of of taking our project to the next level um, and getting the students in, involved in it. Um, and so much so, we're actually thinking of next year's conference theme already. That it's going to be very much focused around the student voice and it's going to be very much a student-led conference and we're going to get them to take ownership of it and uh, so they're kind of taking ownership of their own learning as well so um something um, to look forward to, to next year that's that's if we get through today <laughs> <laughs> So look, thank you so much, um, Maureen, Ellen and Shelley for that. And um, just moving on to the next part of the conference now, um, where we start our um, conference themes. Um, and as I was saying earlier, we have a member from our UDL working group who, who will share each of the themes. So I'd like to introduce um, Cathy O'Kelly, who is lecturer in Faculty of Business and Social Sciences. And Cathy is the chair of our first theme, which is student engagement and capturing the student voice. Kathy, over to you. Thank you very much, Neve. Um, good morning, everybody. So I'm delighted to be chairing this session, um, which is about student engagement and capturing the student voice, which is very much part of the whole UDL agenda. So we have two presenters in this session. We have Laura Hegarty in GMIT, and then we have Dr. Um, Natalia Delimata from IT Sligo. So both ladies are going to have eight minutes to present and then we'll have five minutes for questions and answers afterwards. So I'm sitting here with a stopwatch beside me. So when we have one minute left in the presentation. I'll just let them know that um, we're running close to the time and then we will um, finish the presentation and have questions and answers. So without any more ado, I would like to hand over to Laura and let her commence her presentation. So welcome, Laura, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Hi, Cathy, great. Um, so I share my screen now, is that okay? Yep, that's yep. perfect, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your yeah. screen and we can hear you, Laura. Thank you. OK, great. So welcome, guys. And thank you for the introduction, Cathy. Uh, eight minutes. So I'm going to go straight into it. So what I'm going to cover today is I'm just going to give you an idea of what UDL is on a high level. What is the UDL framework and how can we embed UDL into our practice and give a short summary? I'm not going to go into the extra resources. I've provided the notes. So that's something that you guys can have a look over in your own time. So what is UDL? So UDL, and it's been mentioned um, a few times already, it is known as the universal design for learning. And it is a framework where we can improve and optimize our teaching and learning for all people based on scientific um, insights into how we learn as humans. It has a guide and set of principles for our curriculum development. And what this does is this gives all our individual students equal opportunities to learn including students with disabilities. So sometimes there may be a misunderstanding that UDL is focused around students with disabilities, which is incorrect. When we provide and embed UDL, we're including all individuals, all people. And when we do that, we give power to the students to allow them to be creative in, by providing choice for them for their learning. And from there, they can select their individual path to showcase how they learned and what they've learned. So briefly, what is the UDL framework? So looking at this, um, it's, it's quite a nice image and it goes through, I suppose, the neuroscience research funded. So the UDL framework was designed by CAST in the USA back in 1984. And it looks at multiple means of engagement in the green, multiple means of representation in the purple, and then multiple means of action and expression in the blue. So looking at the left on the, the green, this is the why of learning. So it's about providing multiple means of engagement for our learners to understand why they are learning what they're learning, okay, through different materials. Then the what of learning is 
in order for them to learn, we need to provide different means of representation of data. So every student has a different learning style and ability. So but by providing choice and represent this, this material in that way, they are um, opening up, I guess, the, the options and choices for them through different representations. And then the how of learning is really then how the students can showcase what they've learned through action and expression, okay? So that's kind of quite a whistle stop in the UDL framework. So I just want you all to have a little think about your audience, all the students that you teach. And if you just focus on the image itself, the question is what, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. So they all need to climb the tree. So you've got your six different animals there and they're all going to climb it different ways, different directions, you know, and so on, because they have their own way of getting to the top of the tree. Some may get there, some may not, but, but, but but by providing the choice and pathways for them to do that, they will succeed. And it, through neuroscience, it reveals that really it's, it's very much like unique DNA in our fingertips, UDL, because everybody has different skills, interests, and everybody learns differently. So focusing on our audience is really, really key. Another example is if you want to go into a shop where there's a sale. And it's the same sale for everybody. There's no choice. So it's the same color top, same color bottom. Everyone has different shapes, body sizes, different personalities, but it's one size fits all and that's it. Do you think that's fair? You can all reflect on that. So in a way, this is happening in our education system. So that's why we need variety and we need to bring this variety into our curriculum to provide that choice for our students. So let's think universal. So if you are universal about your design from the very beginning, what you're going to do is cater for all learning abilities. For you, it's important as educators to find your style that you can carry through your curriculum design. And when we do that, learners will become familiar with how we teach, how, we, how they can navigate around our content because they become familiar with our teaching and our style. So from there, in UDL, if we design going forward, if you're not already doing it, and a lot of people are already doing it already, and they don't actually really realize it's actually UDL that they're implementing. But if we provide um, variety in mind and we design our lessons that way, we're going to accommodate everybody. So how do we do that? Well, let's provide different um, multiple ways of, of representing information, allow students to make choices and respond in multiple ways and allow them to engage ultimately in the whole process where they can take ownership of their learning. So in higher education institutes, how can we respond to these challenges? We enter the world of UDL, we learn about it and we implement it. And we're all here today to do that, which is a great start. So in a nutshell, I'm gonna give you a few examples of how you can take away little key um, implementations, hopefully into your practice. So this is just an image from one module that I teach and it just goes through a 13 week semester where I have designed it in a way that all the content for each week is focused within that content block. So they're manageable sections and I roll this out over many of my modules. So my students are becoming familiar with my style of teaching, my style of design, and from there, they're, it's easily signposted and navigated. Here, these are just two screenshots taken from, say, week eight content and week 12 content, where I provide choice of representation. So I give PDF and PowerPoint presentations, same content. It's just the option. Students can pick whichever one they want to open. I have videos. And what the key takeaway for you guys is to think, well, could you create a template for your curriculum that you use for, um, for your work that students will become familiar with it. Another one is making documentations available and by doing that, providing multiple means of representation. So like a PDF, a Word, a PowerPoint, a video. And by providing choice of the same content, you let the students choose which one they want to pick. It'll all mean the same, it's all the same content, but you're providing choice. 
creating videos. We've all learned, especially in the last year and a half, videos has become a real part of our teaching. So by you just turning on and providing closed captions in your video, you are giving that choice to students whether to turn it on or off. So by not doing that, they don't have that choice. And it's really closed captions is not really for, for deaf, um, non-native speakers, you know, while obviously it assists them, we shouldn't really think of it for that target audience. We should think of it for everybody and be inclusive and just to use it because students travel, they're on buses, trains. One minute parks. left. Okay, great. So it allows them to, to have that option to turn it on. Another one, and finally, is hyperlinks. Hyperlinks is a really good supportive inclusion um, tool that you can use, and it provides data um, where students can go directly to the content. It's meaningful, it's gun side posting, and it allows them to um, get to the content easily. This example here is just um, where there's a clickable link and they can go straight to the, the session uh, or they can go to the feedback survey. So it's just providing good sign posting um, for them so that it's easy for them to navigate. And it's a great example of UDL. So there are just a few little bits you can hopefully embed into your practice and hopefully you can take that away. So to summarize, we have different learners, we have different styles, so we need to add variety to our teaching. Life would be boring if we were all the same. So in that way of thinking, provide a choice and um, variability for our students and giving the power to students, allow them to be creative in their learning and selecting their own path. UDL, in my opinion, should be part of our pedagogy and not seen as um, something that we need to do to aid anybody with disabilities. So the last slide here is for you guys as a reflection, how would you implement UDL into your practice? So what I would say is a good way to start is taking micro steps and build on these over time because you need to learn and understand what UDL is and taking little micro steps is a good place to start. And the last comment here is just some feedback I got from a student, which really empowered the work that I did from the AHEAD course with UCD as well for the digital badge. And it was, I felt that given students, sorry, I felt that given us a choice made it more personal and adapted to student learning styles and abilities. I felt that it allowed us to challenge ourselves in different ways. I felt like I was taking ownership. And that's it. So the resources are there as well um, that you can check out. OK, thank you very much, Laura. Um, that was a beautiful presentation. And I see lots of comments coming in for you here in terms of um, the complimenting you on how beautifully you've explained that for everybody. And that's what's brilliant. And thank you very much for that. Now, I have a question for you and anyone who has questions, they're welcome to put it into the, um, the Q&A box there. But could you just tell me it's, you've mentioned it briefly, but how do you start to inform the students about UDL and what steps would you recommend people take to um, educate them in relation to this whole concept? OK, so I suppose I've been kind of um, my previous background, I used to work for the National Council for the Blind. So I would have been used to teaching a lot of um, service users around assistive technologies. So I suppose it's founded from, from that background. So. Uh, for me going forward, what I plan to do and what I have done is I've educated students at the very beginning of the academic year and I've taken all of my classes where I've, I've spent half an hour telling them what is UDL because they will see when I give them assessments, there's choice. When I give them documentation, there's choice. And I want them to understand that it takes work and that they understand what is UDL and why providing choice allows them to create their own learning path and make it easier for them to engage in, in classwork and to provide the choice when they need to showcase their learning. So it's educating the students and taking time out to tell them what UDL is and that they understand, you know, why we're going to the trouble of embedding UDL into our practice. And on the whole theme of student engagement and capturing the student voice, you know, how has that helped your students to approach their work and to complete their work and reach their learning outcomes? So again, kind of linking it back to my work. So I first started with the UDL course um, that I did in 2019, where I embedded a choice when it came to assessment. So I had 256 students and I gave them a choice of, of um, 
presenting in front of me in a class, writing a report or creating a video. And then I backed up you know, resources to support the learning for those choices. And from there, what I have now done is all the modules that I teach, I provide choice for assessment. So I have now rolled it out into all of my modules for all of my assessments. So what it does is it allows the students to, I suppose, select the choice of what way is the best that they can demonstrate what they've learned through choice of a video, of a, um, a presentation or of a report, because every student has different learning styles and abilities, and they have that choice, and they're getting that ownership by providing that choice from me, and it just, and it's, it's very interesting because I get so many different varied ways of students that select video, that select, and you might have thought, well, actually, they're quite shy, but they've presented, so when you give that choice to them, you just allow them to take ownership, which is really, in my opinion, a huge part of UDL. Thank you very much, Laura. And there's lots of um, comments coming in here, people complimenting on the very practical examples. And I was going to ask you about the, um, the, the assessments and the choice. So what I'm going to ask you now <laughs> is what have you learned yourself? Um, like as a practitioner in terms of the choices that students like, what do they value? What appeals to them? That might help the rest of us that, you know, want to give them choices in the next academic year. So what I would say actually is, I actually think a lot of us educators are doing UDL as we speak. And we just haven't realized it until you do the, the course with a head and UCD or even rolled out internally within your organization. You don't actually really understand it till you do it. So that would be a first way to, to get inside the mind of UDL and to do the course. And from there, a part of it is where you embed something in your practice. So you have four to five weeks of embedding something through one of your modules, and then you bring it through to the students and get the feedback. You tweak, you learn, you readjust, and you go and you roll it out, hopefully, in your own time with the rest of your modules. So it's a, it was a huge insight into kickstarting my knowledge and my understanding of UDL which allowed me then to roll it out through all of my content and if there's any GMIT um, colleagues here I, I do be badgering them about UDL too saying you're probably already doing it but you just actually don't realize it so it, and that's the thing taking little micro steps don't think it's a huge part to take on take the little micro steps implement one or two things get the feedback from your students and then you know go and, and carry it through to to increase more embedded UDL. Lots of fabulous um, compliments coming in for you, Laura, that you'll enjoy looking at after. <laughs> so thank you. I want to ask you one last question because someone, um, Teresa Hanley here has raised a very interesting question going, how do you standardize the marking with the different assessments? So when I would provide the choice for, for students to select whatever way they want to submit, they still have the same learning outcomes to achieve. They just take a different pathway to do it. So at the end of the day, I have a rubric and they all will see the rubric that matches the learning outcomes. So they all have to reach it and they just do it in their own way. So it does mean for us as educators that we need to be open minded about how students demonstrate kind of the blue part, um, how they demonstrate their action and expression of what they've learned. So that allows us to even open up our mindset of actually, I never thought of doing it that way. So, you know, we learn from the students and that's another part is we can really learn from, from providing choice. And it's interesting how students take those paths and um, it's a continuous cyclical process and there's loads to learn from students and giving them that choice educates us as educators. I think we could stay chatting here for quite a long time about <laughs> the beauty of it all, but I'm going to have to cut it at this stage. So thank right. you very, very much, Laura, for a fabulous presentation and great you. Um, you know, discussion. So thanks a million. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to invite my colleague from IT Sligo, Dr. Natalie Delimata, to um, give us her presentation. Welcome, Natalie, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you perfectly. <clears throat> thank you. Great. OK, I'll share it now. Okay, um, sorry, I can't seem to open it up. Can you see we it? We have it fully? there, yeah, we have the presentation there, it's perfect. 
Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, firstly, I'm Natalie Delamara, I'm a lecturer in IT Sligo. I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about um, the impact of UDL on my teaching. Um, uh, but I'd like to first start off by thanking Neve, Patricia, Ollie, and Maureen for a wonderful conference. Okay, so first of all, um, my conference title, or my conference title, my uh, presentation title today is Using the Power of Stars to Motivate. Um, what I'm talking about is Creative Practice, which is a module that I teach. Uh, it's part of social care practice. Um, it's one of the first um, modules that they encounter uh, in first year, the first semester, which is a time of real confusion for students. They come in, they're trying to get their accommodation sorted out, their grants sorted out, what class that they go to, all sorts of stuff. Now, Initially, I tried to address uh, their confusion in relation to the module or their questions by giving them lots of handouts. But um, uh, th this seemed to have um, a very limited relevance to them when they arrived at first and wound up kind of papering the bottom of bags more than anything else, I think. Um, another concern that students often had was that they had to be absolutely brilliant at art uh, in order to pass the subject. So a lot of them weren't expecting to have to do uh, art as part of a social care practice degree. So this was a real concern for them. And also in terms of expressing their own creativity, a lot of them felt, I'm not good at art. If I don't do something really phenomenal, I'm going to get laughed at. Um, so that was intimidating and inhibiting for an awful lot of students. From my point of view, you might say, well, why don't you just show them exactly what to do? Um, now, my concern for that is if you show people exactly what to do, they replicate it, which is not really uh, expressing your own creativity. Uh, also, <laughs> if I showed people exactly what to do, my concern was then also that they would simply not turn up to class. They could do it all at home and then I'd never see them again. Um, so in doing the UDL uh, digital badge, which was absolutely excellent, um, part of what I had to do was a redesign project. And as I've kind of intimated, one of the things that um, I had to do was, um, well, the, the problem that I identified was um, trying to um, get uh, students over their fear of creative expression. Um, um, help them picture where they were going with it. So that was a concern that they had um, because they didn't want to act on their own because they um, weren't really clear on where they were going with it. Um, they were anxious about asking because they could see some students seemed to know what they were doing. Um, and they um, uh, also lost track. It's made up of an awful lot of different minor uh, tasks and a lot of them um, found that they got lost a wee bit. So there was a bit of delayed engagement. Students did engage eventually, but it was delayed. Um, so, um, uh, so what was the solution from the universal design point of view was to try and facilitate autonomy. So to try and get the students to act on their own, um, assess their own progress, recruit their interest early, um, uh, uh, be able to address an, uh, a, a clear direct direction to their goals and chunk knowledge. So basically support their engagement early on. So where did the inspiration for this come from? Well, when I was doing my PhD, um, at the, towards the end of it, I was uh, going somewhat round the bend and I met a colleague who I will remain forever grateful to. And I said, listen, how did you manage to do it? What, what did you do? And she said, stars. I was like, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean stars? Now, she wasn't talking about Hollywood stars. She wasn't talking about horoscope stars. She wasn't talking about interstellar bodies. She was talking about the humble star that you might have got a gold sticker on your copybook. Um, and basically what she was suggesting that I do was to uh, chunk the information, make it into small manageable uh, sections, and then give myself a gold star at the end of each section to keep myself motivated and give my sense, uh, myself a sense of where I was going. So that's what I did. I used that and this is what I created. So 
basically what it did was an entire grid using lots of different color, lots of different images uh, and pictures to try and make it accessible to different learning styles and um, in interesting and attractive. So if we look at it in detail, we can see on the left hand side, there's the, the name of the activity. The middle is an image that people can then relate to. They can see where they're going with it. On the top is information um, about um, where to get a video and how to do the activity. And then below that is um, where the materials are, the materials that they need. And that linked also to a page which had photographs of, of where to get the materials cheaply and easily. So they work um, going down the right hand side. Sorry, I've just skipped a slide. Uh, they go, go down the right hand side and then they select something from here. They cut and paste that in. It could be a gold star in my case, or it takes, or they can put in a picture of their dog or their cat or whatever they like. And they work their way down, giving themselves a gold star as they go and um, giving them a great sense of direction until they get to the end. And then there's the information how to submit their project and they know that it's done. Um, so just from a universal design point of view, how did the checklist address the UDL aim? So it facilitated autonomy by allowing students to find and buy materials, create at their own pace, and practice and experiment as often as they like unobserved. So they could do it in their own time. Access progress, they uh, checking off tasks one by one and uh, comparing what they were doing with images or videos allowed students to monitor their progress, feel confident that they were on the right track and estimate the time needed to complete the full assessment. Um, so recruit interest. Seeing what was required eliminated the mystery and fear of creative engagement, removed the stress and made it fun. A clear set of goals. So uh, the checklist provided students with knowledge of where they were going and a map of how to get there. And finally, chunking tasks. Having lots of small um, manageable tasks meant students could get results or rewards from minimum of effort. So they were getting a sense of where they're going with a minimum of effort, which is really sustained interest and is very motivating. So what did the students say? They really, really liked it. They really, really enjoyed it. They engaged very well with it. They were actually very grateful for it, to be honest. Um, so here we see some of the things they said. I love checking each thing off. I've, uh, I have it here now and I'm checking it off as I go. Um, and you can see they, they basically loved it. And some of them also said that they found it really useful when they were going shopping. They didn't have to open up a video or a lecture or anything. They could literally download it onto their phone and they could buy the materials that they needed. So from my point of view, um, One minute in terms left. of students, thank you. Uh, uh, students' creativity was still very much engaged. They really, really did create very well. They found it very motivating. And I gave out, uh, at the end of doing this, more firsts for um, assessments than I ever had done before uh, in my 10 years of teaching. So that's it. Um, it was very, very effective, really enjoyable. Um, UDL is most definitely something I would uh, encourage people to engage in uh, and UDL design um, the, the digital badge, I would encourage people to do it. Um, I would also just like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Tamsin Cavaliera at this point, who is my graphic facilitation lecturer. And I would urge anybody who's interested in doing UDL to consider uh, dovetailing it with graphic facilitation because they really work and so are very, um, they, they work very well together. So thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation. Um, and if anyone's any questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, all I'm seeing is loads and loads of feedback in the, the chat box. Everybody absolutely loving the graphics. Um, I loved particularly, personally, I love the side on engagement, you know, like the student engagement and that. So I think you've really captured everybody's attention here in the audience. And I think you're going to have probably a lot of people following up with you in relation to that. One question that I'd like to ask would be, um, were the students involved in the redesign process? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, they absolutely were. Well, basically what I did was initially I, I asked the students, listen, I'm thinking about doing this. I, I basically said... The design came, as I said, from concerns that I uh, students had addressed to me over the years. And I thought, how am I going to do? It? And then I suggested to the students, this is what I'm proposing to do. And at each stage, I showed them and I said, what do you think? Do you think I should adjust it? And some of them made suggestions, so I would adapt it. So it was kind of adjusted and adapted until the end point. And I, I, I think on the kind of survey that I did, about 97% of the students said that they thought it was 
brilliant. Um, so I, I was delighted. They and um, yeah, very much so. They were uh, they were involved in the whole process. Wow, that's amazing feedback and very um, uplifting as well for you. You know, yeah. in terms of your role, it's brilliant. I have a question here. Somebody's asking about the. Can you please tell us more about the graphics facilitator and how you worked with him or her? That's from Adrian O'Mahony. Okay, um, the, um, I believe Celt is um, was involved in this too. Um, Tamsin Cavaliero is a, a staff member at IT Slag, and she um, has just delivered a, 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 or yeah, we've just completed a digital badge in graphic facilitation, and um, basically showing you how to communicate uh, messages using imagery rather than words, or a combination of both. And I have to say, it's really, really effective. It's really enjoyable as someone who is has a background in art as well I found it really is a great way to combine uh, art and lecturing and discussion but one of the things I would say is you do not have to be good at drawing to do um, graphic facilitation really you don't uh, um, it's very simple and you can build your skills very quickly so it's a very effective way of communicating information thank you for very much. And I see um, you have generated a lot of interest in relation to the UDL badge. So the National Forum, we're going to be very, very pleased with you and the head in UCD. So there are answers being typed in about that, but there is a new national rollout being planned for the coming academic year. So it will start in the um, the autumn just for people that are interested and there will be a call put out in relation to that so I know there's answers being typed into the chat box um, and there's definitely a new digital badge rollout happening it's a very exciting initiative and something to be um, involved with definitely highly recommend it can you um, tell us a little bit more about UDL and graphic facilitation just for our last little bit here um, well Basically, one of the things that I would say, UDL is very much about um, addressing different learning styles. And I think graphic facilitation really facilitates that. Um, if you're a visual person like me, a lot of, of information is, tends to be given to us in um, in text format, um, whereas uh, graphic facilitation allows you to incorporate both text, color, um, pattern, and images as well. So it really does, I think, facilitate um, different learning styles and uh, and ways of communicating. So I think it, it like it, as I said, I think it dovetails very nicely with the principles of universal design and um, as as a way of communicating with a diverse group of learners. I think that's evident from the amount of feedback coming in as well from the audience you're here today. Brilliant. Like someone saying a gold star presentation. So um, wow. that's that's lovely feedback for you, you know. Um, so I think at this stage, uh, it's for me to thank Laura and Natalie very much for their presentations. I think both were very, very informative and gave us a lot of a, a concept of, you know, the, how engaged the students are and how to keep them engaged. And that it's a, a very kind of integrated process between you know, the lecturer and the learner and facilitating their learning. So everybody's winning out of this, which is brilliant. And it's great to get the student feedback. So without further ado, thank you both, Laura and Natalie, for your presentations. And I'm going to now hand over thank to you as well. Ellen McCabe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, so I'll hand over to you, Ellen. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Cathy. Uh, thanks very much to our, our first speakers. They're really great presentations. Um, so the theme for this session is improving the student experience through digital enhancement. And just again, to remind you that um, any questions you want to ask, you can put them in the Q&A box at the bottom there. And our first speaker today is Sheila Farty um, from the School of Science and Computing in GMIT. So welcome, Sheila. And um, she's going to be talking today about games in Moodle. And uh, yeah, so I'll let you go ahead with it there. You've already shared your screen. Um, okay. Thanks. And I'll just give you a little um, a little time warning at a minute to go. Perfect. Thanks very much, Ellen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Great stuff. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And good morning to everyone here. And thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I'm going to describe how I learned about UDL by using games in Moodle as an activity for my students. So games such as Crosswords and Hangman and Millionaire became available in Moodle in GMIT this year as an activity for the first time. And I explored how these games worked for students and how they were received. And if you look at this wordle over here, what you can see is that generally students were very, very positive about games as an activity and indeed other activities as well, such as videos. 
So what I'm going to kind of tell you is the story of how I started to climb the UDL ladder in the sense that previous to this, as digital learning tools, I would have used quizzes. Now, quizzes were well liked by students. They're a good formative assessment tool. And students would often say, oh, give us more practice quizzes. We enjoy doing them and we learn from them. The, another tool that I used to use, and not a digital tool, but uh, I used to use this in classroom activities was, was crosswords. I teach anatomy and I use these crosswords as a problem solving activity to learn anatomical language. So this was previously a paper based activity, but now Moodle allowed me to offer them digitally, which worked quite well, seeing as we were very much online this year. Previous to this, I would hand out these paper based activities in class and often cases students would work together to solve the, the clues within the quiz. But what happened in the online environment where people were working on their own is that one student told me that that would take me one hour to do that activity, which in essence, it should have taken 15 minutes. So I basically said, OK, no, don't do it. We'll look at an other activity instead. And I thought about how I could design another activity that would give the same learning outcome for that particular student. So this is a case of a student pointing me in the right direction to improve their learning. So instead of a crossword, I used the hangman activity, which was now in Moodle. It contained the same crossword clue, and I also included an image to make it easier. Now, this allowed the student to work with the letters to learn how what actual uh, muscle was involved. And it gave a few attempts in terms of getting some letters wrong and helped the student to learn in terms of the spelling of the particular anatomical turn. And the feedback from this one student was this really improved her learning experience. So this got me thinking, if one student really liked this, well, does it work as an activity for more than one student? So I went on to, to survey a group of students that I was teaching these students would have participated in games that I would have designed for them. And overall, the survey population consisted of 161 first year students. 73% were taking a first year common science biology course, and another 27 were taking an anatomy and physiology module. And when I looked at those uh, students, one of the questions I asked them was, how did they see themselves as learners? And a lot of the students, as you can see, they recognized that they, they learned by doing. They were kinesthetic learners. And interesting for me is that the least effective way that students learned was through listening. And given that my title is a lecturer and that I lecture, this was very a very interesting take home point for me. So what I did notice that there was no significant difference between the learner styles in both groups. The other question that I asked them was, did they have a learning difficulty? And the majority did not have a learning difficulty. 8.7% or 14 students had a learning difficulty and were registered with uh, the services in GMIT. But another 22 students or 14% recognized that they may have a learning difficulty. So in that way, it's indicating that they were having a difficulty in learning as it was presented to them. And if I map that again to learner styles, we can see that the students that had a learning difficulty were more likely to learn by doing. So these students had participated in uh, games such as Hangman and Millionaire. And what I did was I asked them a series of 14 questions on a Likert scale so that they could identify with what, what they found beneficial, what they found fun, etc. in terms of these two different games. Now, instead of showing you the 14 different results, what I've done is performed what is called a principal components analysis, which analyzes and correlates variables between these 14 questions and tries to explain the entire student account that was given within these Likert questions into a more succinct solution. So these 14 variables were distilled into three factors, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And for those of you familiar with PCA analysis, there was a very good measure of sampling adequacy of 0 0.859, and the Bartlett's test of severity was also very good. So the three components that came out from the 14 different uh, questions that were asked was that there was a large component of the students who actually uh, were enjoyed the millionaire game. 
So they were motivated to get a good or perfect score in the game. It was a good learning tool for their style of learning. They enjoyed it. It was fun. And it helped them in learning the anatomical and biological jargon that was presented to them within the game. They enjoyed the images were embedded in the game to help them uh, link the structure to the spelling. And uh, they learned by doing the game as well. And the second component that came out is the hangman game. So another group of students recognized that the hangman game was good for their learning style. They enjoyed the game. It was fun for them. They were motivated to get the perfect score and it helped them to learn and spell anatomical and biological jargon. And then the third group that came out was they just enjoyed games for learning. They learned by doing. They learned from more from doing the game than watching or listening to a video or a lecture. And they enjoyed them, they were fun. And it, again, it helped them in learning that anatomical jargon. So overall, what the story for me is that this one student allowed me to focus on what the general population might enjoy as a game. And therefore it changed in terms of what I considered to be uh, the problem. So I considered the problem to be what that one student who had a learning difficulty identified for me saying on, in an online scenario, a crossword didn't work for me and it took too much effort and ge didn't generate the outcome that I intended for that student. So we had to generate a new idea for that student. And what I learned from this is that all activities are not equal and that there are a variety of activities improve the learner experiences overall. And the students really learn by doing and not necessarily by listening. So what I learned from this experience and going through this path in terms of universal design for learning is that in the future, what I will do is something like Laura was mentioning Just one minute morning, there, Sheila. is to offer students um, a variety of ways to engage with the material that I would like them to learn and therefore improve for them their experience with learning and have a range of activities that uh, help them achieve the learning outcomes that we want them to achieve. So for me going forward, I will be implementing more universal uh, design for learning, more games and more activities to help the students uh, with their, their learning. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm very happy to uh, receive any questions. Thanks very much, Sheila. Really interesting. Um, I think it really kind of underlines what we've been talking about, the kind of importance of the student voice and uh, communication is just like really uh, interesting the way you manage to involve students in your kind of teaching process and get them to sort of reflect on their own learning. Um, so um, if you want to uh, just stop sharing your screen there and I guess we'll have a look at some of the questions. Okay. Um, so one of the questions um, is regarding the millionaire game. So um, is that a plugin that was installed on Moodle from the standardized list of plugins on moodle.com? Yeah, this is something that only became available to us this year. Um, and I, I just noticed it in Moodle in the first semester and uh, I was there saying, oh, that's interesting. And especially I had used crosswords previously, as I mentioned, and I had just a piece of software that I was using in terms of printing out crosswords and I would put clues into Excel and generate the solutions with the correct word numbers to add. And I generally found the students found this enjoyable. And I suppose it was enjoyable because it was a break in activity for the students. And I did see them working together to try to uh, solve the, the, the quiz. So when it became available in Moodle, I went, okay, I'm gonna transfer that into a digital format now because that seems to work in this uh, current environment where we're gone more digital and we're not necessarily seeing the students as much. So therefore um, that opened up this new question for students who couldn't work together uh, in, a, in a group activity and had to work on their own. And for a student to spend an hour on something that really should take 10 to 15 minutes really was kind of a negative experience in terms of an activity. 
which I didn't really want for the students. So it kind of pushed me in the direction of what can I do differently? And it started me thinking upon different, what different students would like, and then bringing that out to a broader audience going, well, if one student has this personal experience, there's going to be more within the group that also have that experience. Yeah. And um, did you find um, any of them kind of scored better on exams, depending on which they liked? I didn't delve into it to that level, I'm afraid, as of yet. All I like, I mean, I looked at what the students feedback was in terms of the positivity of the games. And if I was to show you all of the different Leichhardt scales, what you would see is that they really found them very positive. They really enjoyed them. They wanted more of them. And they thought that it was uh, very effective in terms of helping them learn. And because we were online so much, they wanted activities. They didn't want to be listening to lectures or videos. They wanted something that challenged them and get them a kind of a reward as well and get them a couple of opportunities to make a few mistakes and still turn out to have achieved a good outcome within that game. Mm. Yeah, and I think that kind of sustaining that engagement during COVID is something a lot of lecturers have struggled with. So it's a really great way of addressing that as well. And did you design all the games yourself or did you find some online? That's from Helen. Oh, well, what, how it works is because they're all embedded in Moodle and um, they're all Moodle quiz questions. So what I had is I would have had the questions within Moodle previously for practice quizzes, which I've used quite, quite a good deal. So what it meant for me was that I had to change, I suppose, the categories. So I took out questions that were crossword questions, which were, would be short answer questions in Moodle. And then I put that into a category and just put it as a crossword question. Uh, the same for Hangman, there would be short questions in Moodle. And then I started kind of going another little step further and saying, OK, I need to put a, a image in there as well. And that visual, a vi I'm a visual learner myself. So I say I would like the visual with the clue to help me learn the anatomic language. And I think that the, the feedback was the images were very helpful for student learning. OK, so it's kind of like iterative and you're trying out different things and getting the insight from the student then as well as to what's working for them. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and do you find that's kind of like a, a heavy workload or how did you find that in terms of? Well, um, I I've, I've thought about this and what I would say is that um, it, it took me about 10 minutes to convert MCQ questions into a millionaire game. And then probably when I start embedding some images into it, my, that might take me another 50 minutes to do. So within an, an hour, I had a game and an activity from what I had previously created uh, that I was using in quizzes. So if I was using, if I was starting from scratch, it would probably take me a little bit more. But within two hours, I could create alternative activities that would work for students and, and uh it, it, it's, a, it's work, it's always work, but um, I really enjoyed the fact that I was getting so many hits from the students. So when I put on my heat map on Moodle, I might have 172 students within a group and I have 8,000 hits on a particular game. And wow. to me, that's the reward and that's the yeah. satisfaction is that the students are really engaging with this material. And that, that engagement shows enjoyment as comes back in the survey, but it also shows that they're actually engaging with the material. And despite the fact that they may have one learner style in terms of visual or that they are kinesthetic and like doing, they're also reading. So it's kind of a blending of everything together that, that works. So they are probably changing or altering their learning style as they move on as well. Great, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, it's um, something that could really grow and grow, like you've done so much work on it already. And um, the way that you've kind of engaged your students on it is really, really interesting. Yeah. And I think that the thing is, is that like I kind of I, I got pointed in the right direction by a student who had who expressed that this didn't work. And that brought me there. But now that's kind of mushroomed into I'm going to look at all of my courses and see how I can embed this. And I know in other courses, I will have students who rec enjoy reading a little bit more and enjoy the crossword. So it's interesting to see. And I'm looking forward to next year to see what works for different cohorts of students, because all cohorts are going to be different. And again, it's certainly not one size fits all. Absolutely. And I guess that's what UDL is all about, really. Um, but th thanks a million for your presentation and really a fascinating question and answer session as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. So um, 
Uh, we've got um, another speaker from GMIT, Dr. Cormac Flynn, um, and he's going to be talking about providing multiple means of representation for physiology students through Moodle lessons. Um, so whenever you're ready, Cormac, if you want to share Thanks. your screen, I'll hand over Thanks. to you. Thanks, Ellen. You can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Just, um, and can you... Oh, here you go. Great. And I'll just give you a little warning at a minute okay? to go. Yeah, we can see your screen there. That's great. Great. Thanks very much. Um, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here. So I'm just going to talk about a really simple change um, that I made to the module. And also just um, preempt this so I'm broadcasting from rural Galway. So my, my broadband is not the best. So hopefully it stays OK. Um, so just a really simple change that I made to a module that I deliver, um, just trying to implement some new um, UDL guidelines. And these are changes that I made um, after or during uh, doing the UDL badge last year, which I highly recommend. Um, so just to give a bit of context, um, the module is uh, human physiology, and it's a first year module in the biomedical engineering program typically about 40 students, um, and we meet for one hour per week. So it's kind of you know, short and, and intense. So the structure of the module of range is a flipped classroom. Um, so students have something to do before they come to the class. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then it's activity based in the classes, doing activities. And then when they go away, then they've got more activities to do after that. So I might touch base with Sheila, because she sounds like she's got some really good activities to have in the class, which I'd love to, to um, tell a little bit more. Um, so in terms of the, the switch screens here, the, the Moodle page, um, the Moodle page um, is the home, just gives some information about the module, introductory video, um, just giving um, a tour of the Moodle page so students can come oriented. Um, the, the topic so uh, the kind of structure of the module, it's arranged around four learning outcomes. So there's topics within kind of around like the heart, digestive system, the nervous system, and tissue types and function. And then if you dive in, so they spend a few weeks in the nervous system, for example. Um, so when they click on the nervous system, they got a, a bunch of different topics on the nervous system. And so each topic takes one week. Uh, we spend one week in each topic. Um, and the structure of each page is the same, the similar template for each page. So the top of the page, there's some learning outcomes on what they're going to cover that week. Um, there's the pre-class activities that so typically they do Moodle lessons. I'm going to talk about that in a minute or so. Um, in class, then we have some uh, activity. Um, and then when they finish the, the hour that we meet, they've got some post-class stuff to do. And that might take the form of a Moodle quiz, just testing them on what they've done that week, or they work on an e-portfolio and kind of reflect on their learning. So, um, so they do a Moodle lesson. Um, so if we click into the communication ion channels and resting membrane potential, so they have to do this before they meet um, in the class. Um, so the Moodle lesson is a mixture of uh, content and, um, and uh, questions. So students, so this is a, a, a section of a, a lesson from uh, uh, on the heart. So they read some content, uh, or there might even be a YouTube video in the watch. And they answer some questions on that context. The stuff is chunked, so they be a little bit of content work their way through the Moodle lesson. And the feedback on the Moodle lessons have been, it's been generally quite good. Um, students like the opportunity to be able to go through um, content at their own pace and their own time, and then also be able to answer questions as they're doing um, the lesson, just to check their understanding of the material. Um, there has been some feedback that it's quite wordy, or it can be a bit wordy for them. Uh, so there's a lot of reading, a lot of terms to learn, and physiology is like that. It's, quite, it's a wordy topic. There's lots of memorization, lots of terms um, related to the body or, and functions. So they, there's a lot of learning involved. Um, so based on that feedback, uh, a change that I wanted to make was to 
offer students um, a choice of pathways through the Moodle lesson. So they could either read content or look at a video. So just going to give a short demo of that. So if we enter into the lesson, the first page is the learning objectives for that lesson. And then if the student clicks next, eventually the internet connection behaves. Um, yeah, they get a choice. Um, they're asked to say, would you like to watch a video about um, pathway signals to and from the brain, or would you like to read some content? So if a student says, I'd like to read some content, they click on that, on this link here, and they should get a page of, um, of content. So in this case, there's you know, some, kind of, um, some text, an image, and then some details about you know, sensory input and motor response. And then when they click next again, they will get some questions on that content on the page that just read. Apologies for the slow um, connection here. Um, yeah, so there's some questions, series of questions on that. Um, and then they go on to more content. Now, if the student um, decides, oh, I prefer to watch something, um, they click on, I'd like to watch a video. So this is the change that I made. Um, then they would get a page with a video embedded in it. Um, so the video will appear here. Um, so it's something I created, it's just uh, screen recorded uh, myself, just building up the content from scratch. So there might be an image, and then I'm um, just labeling that image and talking about the image. And um, it covers the same content that would have been on the page where they were reading. Um, so it's just given in different formats. It's, it's building it up from the ground as opposed to just presenting all the content all at once to them. Um, and then when they hit next, they're presented the same set of questions that um, a student would have got when uh, if they just read, read the content instead. Um, yeah, I'll move on from this because it's, it's a bit slow. They get the same questions uh, and they work their way through the lesson. Um, so there'll be a series of choices that they'd have to make, whether to watch a video or read a recent content. And then to finish up the conclusion, they all end up at the same point uh, where they have an opportunity to provide feedback on the lesson. So there's a Padlet embedded into the Moodle lesson where they can just post some anonymous feedback on that. Um, just a minute. So in terms of the, thank you, in terms of the UDL, how does it do? So in terms, it's, it's it's offering choices within multiple means of representation. So it's giving a choice between uh, your reading and uh, video, and then also the video is kind of closed captions uh, providers. So they can, don't have to listen to me, they can just watch and uh, read the closed captions as well. Um, in terms of comp the comprehension options as well, the, the Moodle lesson itself provides an opportunity for students to go step by step and get the information chunked and then also be able to. Um, uh, rate the progress uh, or evaluate their progress by answering the questions. Um, I told the students what they liked and what the, um, about the um, about the choice. Um, most students would prefer reading. Reading definitely came out on top. They prefer to reading. But interestingly, they, even though most of them do like reading, every, almost all the students do appreciate having the choice of watching a video or reading about um, um, the content. Um, some specific quotes, um, general mix, you know, the, your videos are a lot better than the, the slides for them. A few, these three diagonal comments here, that, um, some students do like to read both, uh, or you do both to watch the videos or read the content. And that might be um, one particular case was a student whose English was a second language. So they watch the video, but they feel they might miss some of the, um, uh, the talking. So they'd like to have the backup of being able to read something as well. So they do appreciate both formats. Um, that's it. Um, just a short, simple example of implementing UDL into a module. Um, the key points for the students do like having the choice. Um, but there is a small, consistent number of view the videos, most like the, um, the reading. But about a quarter of the class, I'd say, would watch the videos each week for the lessons. Um, so on that, I'm going to have to expand it a little bit. So I've just done all offered choices of the semester two topics. So I just have to go back and do the semester one topics. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much for um, listening and happy to answer any questions.
Great, thanks a million. That was really interesting presentation again, and a lot of um, uh, very appreciative comments uh, coming in uh, to do with the flexibility you're offering students, and um, which is of course like really crucial in terms of UDL. Um, and I think as well the kind of the way you've staged your content or kind of chunked content, which is a simple thing, but like can be so important to students in terms of um, making it digestible to them. Um, and uh, and as well as it was kind of interesting to see like the variety of experience, you know, the shame, the, the way some students preferred different things or combining things and it kind of had a positive impact on maybe students that uh, who were who experience you hadn't intended. Um, so that's the, the great thing about UDL. And what did you kind of find in terms of the level of engagement uh, with your Moodle lessons? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty high, um, I think. You know, there, there is there is a requirement to do this for before the class. So I want the students to be prepared in class. So that, you know, the activities that they do in class are more meaningful for them. So that I do give micro marks for them. So each lesson is about half a percent. Um, I found you know, in previous years you might get you know seventy to eighty percent would do the lesson. So it's pretty high. But I, I found this year is even higher. I'm not sure is that just because the course is fully online, so students have kind of more time to engage with that. Um, Generally, it, it, it also requires um, a little bit of effort at the start of the year to follow up on students who aren't who aren't engaging with the, the lesson. So generally, each week I would send emails to anybody who hasn't hasn't um, hasn't got it completed. But you know, certainly by the end, the middle of the semester, middle of the first semester, towards the end of the first semester, you know, most students are engaging with it and realize you know, they appreciate the, the value of of. Um, getting the content before the actual, actual meet, actually meet in the class. So it's a, a more um, engaging hour. It's, you know, it's only an hour, so it's pretty short. Um, so if you're not prepared, you're going to, um, you, you blink and you'll miss that class and mm. get to benefit from it. Yeah, so they can see the benefit then of kind of supporting the actual face to face time they do have. Yeah. Um, just a, a question in there. Would you use um, videos from Khan Academy or do you record all the videos yourself? I record all the videos myself. Um, now, in the lessons, there are some videos. I do like the Khan Academy, definitely. Um, there are some uh, YouTube videos embedded in the, in the, I guess, the reading part, the reading option. So they can still watch videos. Um, but any of you know, the alternative pathway where I um, offer you know, the video is, is me talking and building up the content from scratch. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a benefit to having, it, you know, gets the student, hopefully it gets the students to know me a bit more just by listening to me, just delivering the content um, as opposed to, um, you know, somebody that they're not, they don't know from the, from the web. Yeah, and I suppose that is a huge thing, especially at the moment, you know, that kind of connection with the students and, um, you know, it's well as a challenge for everyone, the kind of personalization and building relationships, but um, anything that can kind of support that. But what did you find was kind of the biggest challenge in terms of implementing alternative path, uh, pathways in the lessons? At the time, just the time. Uh, initially, um, I think when I started doing the videos, you kind of agonize over little details and you spend you spend way too much time trying to make a perfect video, which is never going to be the case. Um, but I think over time, you kind of, um, you, it, just, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got mistakes in the videos, you can just correct them as they go along. And st I think students might appreciate that kind of, that human aspect that we're, we make the mistakes and we, we, we forget certain terms and we correct ourselves. And that hopefully students can kind of take heart from that, that it's okay to, okay to fail so um it, with that then it actually required less time to make the videos as you go along because you're not spending the agonizing over ed editing and um things like that mm, yeah that's very true i think a lot of us can probably relate to that especially if you're kind of starting out making digital content kind of letting the perfect be the enemy of the good is a huge thing and you're right you know like i think students can appreciate the kind of human side if you make a few mistakes it's not a big issue it makes it more authentic yeah, um, um, the advantage of the videos then, you know, they're good for a few years, so that's not something I'm going to have to go back and change for a while. Um, mm, as, yeah. As my voice yeah. and face changes dramatically. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's kind of a good investment then. 
yeah. um, in terms of time. But uh, yeah, you get a huge amount of um, compliments in the chat there, um, oh, just on um, the the level of flexibility and the quality of the content you're providing to the students, and um, so it's great. A little bit of inspiration there for people, I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's a simple change. Uh, uh, you know, recommend, and I, I'll plug the, the UDL badge um, from the National Forum. It's, it's, this is, it definitely gets you started in thinking about UDL for sure. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, so that, uh, thanks a million for that. Um, Very really, Thank you. really interesting presentation and great uh, uh, questions and answers as well. Um, so um, just, yeah, thank you again to Dr. Sheila Farty and Cormac, Dr. Cormac Flynn. Um, and that kind of concludes our, our morning session. So we're going to have a short break now. And the next session is um, learning through COVID-19, flipping the classroom using UDL. And that's going to commence at 12 o'clock. <laughs>